Good morning, this is Mr. Y. This will be our biology introduction lecture. Uh, don't forget that if you want to download this PowerPoint and any of the other PowerPoints uh, that you're seeing on YouTube, you can always do that via my class website and then just print them out to take notes on directly. Otherwise, just be taking notes as regular in your class notebook. And I'll emphasize during this first lecture especially where you definitely want to record some stuff. So if you need to pause the video at any point, please do that. And, and some other stuff where you don't have to necessarily take the notes, but it helps with explanations of certain things. So with all that said, we're gonna get started here on our introduction to biology stuff. So in science, there are two general paths that any scientist can use to learn something brand new. That is to say stuff that's not in any research or any textbooks or anything like that. For totally brand new things, there's two general ways to approach this. And this works in any science, not just biology. So this can be applicable to anything. It's just there's some areas where one way works better than another. And so we'll talk about that and why biology actually runs the gamut of both of these. So. <clears throat> The first way, which I'm sure you hit upon in middle school, is through experimentation, running experiments. Now, this is typically done in a laboratory setting. That is to say, in a very controlled setup place. Um, it's not always that way. Sometimes you can run it outside, but it really depends on what you're doing. But in most cases, uh, most lab situations are there to run experimentations. The other way is through what we call observations, and this is done in the field and by field we just mean outdoors out in nature wherever there is a possible way to make a new brand new observation that's never been recorded before observed before now the differences experimentation is nice but it costs money that's to say there are many scientists who spend a lot of their time trying to get money to actually be able to pay for all the materials and all the costs of doing their experiments. And then on top of that, they have to design the experiment, run the experiment, run through all the results of the experiment, make sure everything looks good. So yeah, time and money are a big cost to true experimentation. But the benefit of this, the trade-off of this, is that the results you get from all this effort put in tend to be much more error free when compared to say observation. So it does cost a lot of time and money. And in many cases, you know, scientists, they take whole courses on just how to write what we call grants, how to get money to perform these experiments, because they know they need that kind of investment to make their experiments go well. And in many situations, because you are oftentimes looking for money to actually be able to run your experiments, that means you have to be able to put the best foot forward that say you have to have an advanced education in the area you're studying. So if you have two people who are trying to run an experiment on DNA and one of them is a high school graduate and the other is a doctorate, who do you think is going to get the money? It's the person with the advanced education. And on top of that, the advanced education allows you to make sure your results are more error free because ideally you have more experience running experiments. You have more experience looking at the results. So experimentation in the laboratory, yeah, that's definitely a thing. And it can be done by novices. It can be done by anybody. But for the advanced stuff, you'd have to have lots of money and a pretty good advanced education in most situations. The good news is, is that, as I said, you get a lot more reliable results that way. And you guys know at least the basics of this from middle school. It's called the scientific method. Now, I will have a whole lecture talking strictly about the scientific method and how it iterates upon itself to make experimentation work better and better to more um, fully support better hypotheses. But it's a lovely little thing. It does have a big uh, initial startup cost in terms of time and money and of course education. On the other side, observations, as I said, they can be done at a much, much cheaper cost. At most you pay for the cost of going out into the field and the cost of having specific recording equipment. And that can be you know, somewhat expensive, but compared to how much money some experiments cost, it's nothing. Um, anybody can do observations in the field, that's fine, but uh, the problem again becomes if you don't have at least a basic education, 
the results you get can be misleading if you don't understand what you're looking at or if you don't at least understand the basic concepts of what is an observation and what is an inference what is actually happening versus what you think is happening and so many basic observations in the field have led to good experiments later on but many times observations in the field are misinterpreted if a person is jumping to conclusions they're making inferences instead of just telling people what they observed um, but again anybody can do it and again cost can be practically nothing compared to an experimentation now there is some overlap between these two general pathways um, in biology we can do both we can do experimentation and we can do observation and in truth you can do both in almost all science fields some fields like chemistry tend to lead more towards experimentation some other fields like astronomy where you have to study stuff that's very far away tend to work better with observation but with biology we kind of get the best of both word worlds they overlap so there are some things the that they have in common first both require being able to make good measurements if that's necessary uh, being able to collect and analyze the data that starts with understanding how to do graphs and basic measurements so we will be hitting upon that later on i hope they both require clear writing skills that is to say you have to be very clear and experiment what is actually happening recording your results clearly to the highest degree of accuracy you can also you have to be very clear in an observation in the field setting writing down exactly what occurred how it occurred when it occurred and being very clear so that it can be in many cases hopefully observed again and again with experiments you want them to be able to be repeated by others so again you have to be very clear in your writing skills i did this experiment going step a b i skipped c and then went to d first and then went back to c so you have to be very clear in your writing styles the goal for either pathway however is essentially the same it's to use either path to have a new discovery a new results that have what you call credibility that's not to say you've proven everything don't use the word proved anybody who uses the word proved in science is really not supposed to be doing that you can have greater supporting evidence for an idea a hypothesis but you can't technically prove it don't ever use that word proof but the goal is to give yourself enough credibility to, to where somebody can look at what you did be it an observation or experiment and say huh that makes sense or that at least seems like something that anybody could have done it it's not indicative to just what you did by yourself so you want good credibility with either an observation or an experiment so in biology as I said we can do both of these but let's clarify and back up just a second here and let's talk about what is biology now biology in its basic form is essentially just the study of life the study of living things is another way of saying it and of course that leads us to the next most commonly asked question okay then what the heck is life and a better way to actually approach this is to probably say what makes living things be considered alive compared to say non-living things and what makes something like a rock be considered alive to say something like a tree so as it turns out the best way to probably approach this is to look at life and look at all its essential traits all its necessary traits all the things that life needs or has that makes it alive and you should have come across a few of these in middle school and you probably know a few of them but i'm going to run through a relatively complete list i i've seen other science teachers in other places they do a list that's partial to this i tend to make mine a bit more complete than i think most others do so there's going to be a couple of things on here that you've hopefully seen before and probably some you haven't so grand total of nine and if you wanted to pause and just write down what you think it takes for life to be considered alive go ahead give it a try and let's see how your results compare up but i'm going to run through the first five right now first the ability to reproduce all life has that ability all life has the ability to grow all life has a metabolism or needs a metabolism all life has cells and all life needs water I'm hoping a few of those you've heard before even if you don't recognize number three for instance um, we'll get back to that and explain that in a bit some more advanced ones all life has either DNA or RNA all life can evolve over time all life can respond to its environments that is to say to changes in its environments and all life has a clear internal and external areas of its quote 
body area, whatever you consider its body to be for that organism. And so what I'm going to do is um, say for the purposes of this first lecture, make sure you get this list down in your notes. So if you need to pause the video, fine, pause it, get this down. Also get uh, that prior slide on observations and experimentations down as well. But what I'm going to do for the remainder of this is just go through each of these and make sure it's clear to you what I'm referring to. In many cases, it may be clear to you from middle school. In many cases, it may not be. So if you need to jump around a bit just to make sure things are clear to you and take further notes, that's fine. Really what I want you to make sure you understand is this list here. So make sure you pause the video, get what you need. If you want to add some clarification from the um, upcoming slides, that's fine. So. The first one, all life has the ability to reproduce. Now, that means that all life has the ability to create new separate individual organisms that are similar to themselves, um, but not necessarily identical. And this is usually done in one of two ways, either sexually or asexually. So for instance, this here is the New Mexico whiptail. It is actually one of the uh, largest species that is capable of doing um, asexual reproduction in terms of animals. Uh, it's an, a female only species that, that's kind of strange and it's kind of nice that it is here in New Mexico. Um, it undergoes what we call part, I'm going to say this wrong, parthenogenesis. You can see the word right here. But yeah, it actually reproduces asexually. All these ones you see around New Mexico are entirely female. And of course, there's other lizards that reproduce primarily sexually. But reproduction is essential to all life. And again, that's animals, plants, tree, you know, animals, plants, funguses, protists, and bacteria. They all reproduce either sexually or asexually. In addition to that, the other one that goes usually hand in hand that students remember is that all life has the ability to grow, to start off in a younger, often what we call larval form, and mature either chemically and often physically into an adult form. So over here we have the seeds to a coastal redwood, which is the largest tree in the world. And you can see the size here is nothing compared to the size here. So growth is a natural ability of life to develop from a larval state, a younger state to a more adult state. And that's once they reach the adult state is usually the time that they're capable of reproduction. So you can't reproduce until growth has occurred. So these two tend to get remembered and put hand in hand with one another, which is why I left them on the same slide. So the next one, all life has metabolism. That is to say, all life has the ability to take in energy um, and produce or modify that form of energy into a different form that's useful for itself, while also having the ability to get rid of waste products. Now, when we say take in energy, this can be in the form of chemicals, like with food, that's what basically our food is, it's chemical energy, or taking in um, radiation. This would be plants that take in light to do photosynthesis. And again, the idea is every organism, whether it's one cell or trillions of cells, has essential needs of getting energy. And the basic ingredients can be different from species to species. So for humans, of course, we take in oxygen, water, dry food, you know, various forms of inputs. And what comes out, carbon dioxide, of course, sweat and breath, as say again, sweat and carbon dioxide that way, urine, fecal matter, and heat. So metabolism is just the ability to process energy to keep the life functions going for an organism. And one of the more common misconceptions we see about this particular one, or that I see about this particular one, is the idea of students saying all life needs oxygen. That is not true. Not all life needs oxygen. In fact, Many, many, many species have oxygen as a toxin to them. It kills them. Um, oxygen is very, very toxic to many types of bacterial species, usually single cell species, but they can grow in colonies too. And so oxygen is in no way useful to them. They don't use it at all, and it will in fact kill them. So make sure you understand, just saying all life needs oxygen, no, that's incorrect. That gets you nothing. You have to understand that all life needs a way to take in energy, to use that energy, and then to get rid of the waste products as well. Next up, all life has cells. <clears throat> all right, cells are the smallest unit of life. That is to say, anything smaller than a cell, we don't consider it to be alive. 
And there is a little asterisk here, and I'll explain what that's for in a minute. But life is basically built out of cells. If you think of life as kind of like an analogy to Legos, life is a combination in many cases of just several of these different little Lego blocks, and each Lego block would be like a cell. Cells themselves, individually, each have all the other properties of life that were on that list. And so we spend a lot of time in biology talking about cells because at the basic level, if you understand the cell, you understand all the fundamental interactions of life. And of course, I'm assuming you, at this point in since middle school, you've seen a basic diagram or two of cells. Here you have a typical animal cell and a plant cell and a bacterial cell. Um, one quick note, while they look different, they are also not to scale. That is to say, while these two, the animal and the plant cell are about the same size, the bacterial cell here is really like only as big as this mitochondria there in blue at best usually. So there is a size difference in terms of cells as well, not just a shape difference. And we'll talk about all the different functioning organelles in here later on. Um, but many species like bacteria, they're not only just small cells, but in many cases, they're just single cells for the whole organism. That's the entire organism itself. Its whole body, if you want to call it that, is a single cell. Yet that single cell can do all the, has all the abilities of uh, of the rest of the list of being alive. Now, for our purposes, in the case of multicellular creatures, well, we have cells that are, yes, quite larger, and on top of that, they can, in many cases, well, in all cases where it's multicellular, become different types of cells. Despite the fact they all have the same DNA, you have several trillion cells in your body, some of which are red blood cells, some of which will be nerve cells, some of which will be connective tissue or bone tissue or muscle cells or intestinal cells or fat cells or smooth muscle cells. So some cell, uh, many cells in a multicellular body have the ability to differentiate, to become different sorts of cells where they focus in on one particular purpose, to become tissues and then those tissues working together in conjunction become an organ or an organ system. Now, that little asterisk I mentioned before up here, here's where it comes back to kind of throw us a sideways curve. We like to say all life has cells, and most biologists are okay with this, except usually the people who study vir viruses, virologists. Viruses are possibly the only exception to this little rule here. Viruses are kind of weird. They're not non-living things per se. They have many of the other properties of life. They have the ability to evolve. They have the ability to respond to their environments, but they're not made of cells. They're much, much smaller than even the bacterial cell here. They're really small in many cases. Um, but viruses kind of fit into their own little world of we're not sure if they're living or non-living because viruses, while they're not made of cells, they also can't reproduce on their own. They have to go in to a cell and take over a cell and hijack that cell's machinery, internal machinery, for them to reproduce. So viruses, we don't usually, in the strict sense, call them alive, but if you talk to some people who study viruses, they'll say we treat them as if they're alive anyway. So viruses are kind of this weird little exception to this all life has cells rule. So the next one, all life needs water. And here's a molecule of water here, H2O. And the basic justification for why does all life need water is because inside of the cell, you have all these different organelles working but they all are not just flopping around by themselves, they're actually floating. And what they're floating in is this stuff called cytosol right here. They have it shaded in blue right here. Um, water is the main part of this cytosol, this fluid in the cell. It's often called jelly-like in some cases, but it's kind of more fluidy than that. Um, this is what's holding everything kind of up in a cell together. It works as what we call a medium. Um, it's mostly water, as I said, and this is where all the chemical reactions in the cell will take place if they're not inside an organelle already. So it kind of works as a base for the cell to operate. You can think of a canvas of a painting is what I say here in this analogy. The canvas works as the medium for all the colors to go onto the painting and to mix in various ways. Well, the cytosol is the medium of a cell and cytosol is again, mostly made of water. 
all life has either DNA or RNA. And in most cases, in the cases we'll be talking about in most reality, it's DNA. In some cases, certain viruses, things like that, you'll also find RNA in use, but usually it's DNA. DNA is important because in order to reproduce properly, there has to be instructions for the next generation of organisms. That is to say, how many cells do you build? Do you build one cell or do you build a trillion cells? When do the cells stop building up new parts of this organism? Where do you build them? What type of cells do you make them into if it's a multicellular creature? And all the internal chemical reactions for keeping these cells working individually, cohesively, independently, you know, alive altogether, that has to come from instructions inside the DNA or RNA. And so in a typical animal cell, you of course find the DNA inside this one little dark spot called the nucleus. It's usually not in this shape, but it's a nice way to see it under the microscope is when it takes this chromosome form. And the DNA itself is just this long chain. There should be little rungs here very very long we'll spend a good deal of time talking about this and there are certain segments of dna that are called genes and all this does is provide instructions from one generation to the next how again how many cells to make what kind of cells to make them into and a good analogy for this that i found is you can think of dna like a cookbook in a very liberal sense inside of a general cookbook you can find a couple hundred recipes now, inside of your DNA, there's a couple thousand recipes, if you want to say, from different genes. Each gene is a different recipe, and each gene produces a different product. Like, each recipe produces a different baked material. Each gene produces a different protein. We'll talk about that whole process when we get to the next. But again, all life has these instructions, because without them, you couldn't build life to be what it needs to be life can evolve over time now let me make some clarifications about this statement when we say evolve over time we mean change over time but again two big things to emphasize we say change what we mean is we mean changes for a whole population not individuals individuals don't evolve i'm sorry if unless you already have them you're never going to evolve for instance wings populations will change and i'll give you an example here in a minute but it's not an individual that evolves. So we don't mean a single cell can suddenly evolve, you know, new abilities that it never had. It's slow changes in population. And again, we say change over time. We mean time on a long span, thousands to millions to billions of years. Evolution typically takes a lot longer than a human lifespan in most cases. So for instance, here is the basic understanding of the evolution of whales and dolphins, which you can see down here. All this is coming from the fossil record and DNA records. And you can see there's several species here that are extinct. That's why their little lines here stop. So these are all extinct and we know about them via fossil records. And you can see there's a line here continuing on for things like hippopotami and then a common ancestor back here. Again, there wasn't just an ancestor back here that immediately jumped down and became a dolphin once it got into the water. No, it was a slow, gradual process. And again, the gradualness of this can change, but it's usually longer than a human lifespan in most cases. And again, this little asterisk pops up because viruses, once again, can be an exception to this. Viruses reproduce so quickly, we can see viruses evolve over the course of a few years because they are very, very small and they reproduce really quickly. So anybody studying diseases, bacterial diseases or viral diseases is often worried about, well, how can this disease, how can this virus, how can this bacteria possibly change if it's treated with one type of medicine? If it evolves, maybe it's not gonna be treatable with that same medicine anymore. And this is why you have so many different types of antibiotics. Um, one of them may not work forever and the virus or bacterial uh, system might change. Again, um, antibiotics don't work against viruses, but again, same thing with vaccines. If a virus changes, a vaccine may not be very uh, affected by it if the virus has evolved be to become vastly different. All life can respond to changes in their environments. So this does not mean 
all life can physically move. We tend to think respond means movement, and it does to a limited extent, but that's not the only way you can respond to things in terms of life. There can be biochemical changes, behavioral changes, growth changes, communication changes, you gotta think of pheromones for that. And yeah, movement can be involved too for those creatures like animals or protists that do have the ability to move. So let's talk about things that don't have the ability to move but can still respond to changes. Here are two plants, and you can see this one here on the left is changed its direction of growth. This is called gravitropism. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, it's the ability for plants to actually tell which way is up and which way is down. They do have the ability to do it. It's based upon cells towards the tip here. And there's a lovely little video, I think that'll be on one of my plays that talks about how they're able to do this. I think it'll be on the evolution playlist. But yeah, they can actually respond to changes in terms of how they're oriented. Another way you can see plants change, they also have the ability to grow towards the light. Anybody who's done any basic gardening understands this. It's called phototropism. Uh, plants can tell which way gets them the most direct sunlight and they will grow in that general directions. And in often cases, they'll actually force their roots to grow in the opposing direction. Um, and again, it's based upon roots towards the tip on either side, going either towards the light or away from that general direction. So yeah, plants can respond to their environment in different ways. Uh, another way you see um, response to changes in the environment is what we call the avocado trick. Uh, many fruit species will ripen their fruit all at the exact same time, and it's not uh, usually in the way you think of it. What happens is when a fruit ripens, it releases this gas called ethylene gas, right down here, get this in red. Here. Um, and it actually signals the other fruit on the tree to ripen as well. And so we have learned how to take advantage of this a little bit with things like the avocado trick, which is if you buy an avocado and it's really hard, it's not ripe, what you can do is you can t stick it in a paper bag with a banana, a uh, ripening banana. The banana, which will ripen pretty fast, will release this ethylene gas and will actually trigger the avocado to start to ripen as well. It's kind of taking advantage of this little situation for us. And so plants can respond through changes in growth uh, to their environment and through communication changes. And yet, even in some cases, behavioral changes. And yes, you can have behavior without movements. And then finally, all life has a clear internal and that's say internal versus external environmental system. Life, whether it's single celled or whether it's a body of cells, always has a barrier that separates the outside of the organism from its inside. And inside that organism is usually a pretty stable internal environment that's different from the outside. And that internal environment is where all the internal chemical reactions that occur uh, to keep it alive happen. So in your typical cell, of course, the barrier between the inside and the outside of the cell, well, there can be multiple layers. There can be things like cell walls as too, but the basic barrier that exists on all cells is this thing. This is the cell membrane. You can see it looks fairly complex, but we will talk about that this year. There's lots of little different parts to it. It has different layers, but there's a clear outside of the cell and a clear inside of the cell and the environment in each place may be different. The outside of the cell might be different from the inside of the cell in terms of temperature, pH, what chemical reactions are occurring. So there has to be this barrier between uh, the outside of the organism and the inside of the organism. And of course, when you talk about things like multicellular organisms, yeah, you have barriers too, even if you're not talking about their different cells. So all these little purplish dots here are cells in the epidermis of human skin. They'll say this is the outer layer of dead skin cells and this is the living layer of tissue down here. So there is barriers whether you're talking the micro scale, the cell, or the macro scale, the multicellular creatures as well. All life has these two barriers. And so this has been the entire list. I hope you guys understand everything. Go back, rewatch as much as you need to. Uh, take notes, as I said, on just the basics of the list, if nothing else, and that two-pathway system in science, and make sure you ask questions in class.